Life is like one giant, winding, dangerous roller coaster that we have no idea when it's going to end. Just like a roller coaster, in life, we have to feel the lows to appreciate the highs. Stop to smell the flowers because one minute we're here and the next we're not. I'm Ryan from Tragedy Tales and welcome back to the channel. Today, back by popular request, we're going to look at some of the most bizarre deaths that you won't believe are true. Now these stories are real and involve real people who tragically lost their lives. By sharing these stories, I hope to honor their memory and remind ourselves to cherish each and every moment that we have. So buckle up and prepare yourself for yet more bizarre deaths. This story is the definition of the meaning when death calls, you must answer. On March the 30th, 2015, a regular trip to the cemetery for an elderly couple ended in tragedy. That cold spring morning, a 74-year-old man named Stephen Wojtak and his wife made their way from Scranton, Pennsylvania to St. Joseph Cemetery in Throop. They'd visit frequently, especially around Easter, where they would decorate the grave with Easter ornaments and tie a cross to it. It was a tradition that they both cherished deeply. The pair arrived at the cemetery at approximately 10 a.m. carrying the Easter decorations that they bought the day before. And as usual, they tied a cross to the grave and stood there for a while, smiling and shedding tears. Stephen then knelt down to attach an ornament to the headstone and without warning, the headstone toppled over and hit Stephen's head with immense force, crushing it completely. His wife could do nothing but scream in horror. The screams caused cemetery workers to rush over to help, but the headstone was far too heavy. An ambulance was called. Unfortunately, they could not save his life, and he died right there in the graveyard. Eerily, he was buried just a few feet from where he died, right next to his mother-in-law. He had no idea that when he was driving to the graveyard that day, he was driving to his death. A cemetery caretaker explained that the bases of the headstones often sink when the ground thaws, making them susceptible to tipping over. The broken grave remains in the cemetery to this very day, a tragic reminder of the unimaginable tragedy that occurred to a faithful couple who had only come to pay their respects to their loved one. When you're on holiday, lighting a cigarette, enjoying the sunset, this is the very last thing you expect to happen. In April of 2019, a 67-year-old man from Wisconsin named Patrick McGuire hopped on a plane to Scotland along with two friends and his wife, Anna. None of them had been to Scotland before. They were all eager to experience the Scottish Highlands and possibly get a glimpse of the famous Loch Ness Monster. After a long flight, the group arrived in Scotland. They then got a taxi from the airport to the jaw-dropping Glengarry Castle Hotel near Invergarry, a 19th century country house situated between Loch Ness and Loch Lochy in the heart of the Scottish Highlands. However, on that cold April day, the unblemished history of the hotel would be ruined forever. On the evening of April the 12th, the sun began to set on the beautiful Scottish Highlands and the group prepared for bed. The trip was nearly over and they'd had such a good time. At approximately 10.30 p.m., Patrick told his wife, Anna, that he was going outside for a cigarette and to take photos of the sunset. Thinking nothing of it, Anna continued watching television until she checked the time. It was now 12.30 and Patrick had not returned. Now dark outside, Anna phoned him and there was no answer. A sinking feeling began to build in her stomach. Anna quickly got her shoes on and rushed down the hotel stairs. 
frantically checking for any sign of her husband. Finding no sign of him, she went looking outside. As Anna continued to phone Patrick, she circled around the outside of the hotel, when all of a sudden, she could hear the muffled sound of the phone ringing in the distance. She followed it, but nothing could prepare her for what she was about to discover. Upon reaching the phone ringing, she found Patrick upside down in one of the metal benches out front. He was sitting in a seated position completely upside down, with his chin on his chest and his face jammed against the hotel's wall. Anna immediately checked for a pulse, but there wasn't one. He was cold to the touch. Ambulances were called, but they could do nothing. Patrick was declared dead on the scene. A nice trip will now always be remembered as a tragedy. A health and safety investigation revealed that when Patrick sat down to light his cigarette, eager to get a photo of the sunset, the 72 kilogram bench, or 158 pounds, sunk backwards into the wet grass, toppling over itself. The impact knocked Patrick unconscious, and with no way to help himself, the weight of the bench pinned him to the wall, ultimately leading to positional asphyxia. The hotel's insurers carried out a risk assessment of the hotel, and the benches were not identified as a risk. Despite this, however, the hotel accepted full responsibility for the tragic accident, and because of this, they were only fined £14,000 for breaches of health and safety. In court, they said that they previously attempted to solve the issue of the sinking benches with wooden blocks embedded in the grass, but it's clear that it wasn't enough and sadly cost a man his life. This tragic story begins in the magnificent yet desolate Arches National Park in eastern Utah. This 120 square mile desert is renowned for its high density of stunning rock formations, which attract over 1.2 million visitors from across the globe each year. On June the 13th, 2019, 25 year old Esther Nakajiko, a celebrated human rights activist from Uganda, who was known to her friends as Essie, matched with a handsome man named Ludo Michiard on Tinder. They hit it off and fell madly in love, getting married in March of 2020 without waiting for venues to reopen. On June the 13th, 2020, exactly one year after they had met on Tinder, the newlyweds were in the middle of a camping trip in Arches National Park. Ludo had previously visited the park with his family and wanted to share the beauty with his new wife. After hiking to the Delicate Arch, one of the park's most famous rock formations, they had a packed lunch before returning to the car that they'd rented out. The sun was hot, but the wind was strong that day. As the pair drove through the park's exit gate, a sudden gust of wind blew it open, causing it to collide with the passenger's side window, ripping through it at 70 miles an hour. Ludo was completely covered in blood from head to toe. With the coppery smell of blood in the air, he turned to look and saw his wife's decapitated body slumped in the passenger seat. A total nightmare come true. Paramedics arrived on the scene, but of course, nothing could be done for Esther. Her remains were flown back to Uganda to be buried and her family is determined to continue her legacy. Ludo was diagnosed with PTSD shortly after the accident and Esther's family prepared to sue the US Park Service for negligence. After a two-year court battle, they were awarded $10.3 million in damages in January of 2023. This tragic incident could have been easily avoided with a simple $5 padlock or by simply securing the gate correctly. Unfortunately, it was left to blow in the wind and an amazing young woman lost her life leaving her loved ones to pick up the pieces. This bizarre story begins in my home country, in the UK, more specifically Cambridge Circus in London. 
The afternoon of Friday, January the 27th, 2023, was a day like any other for 60-year-old maintenance worker Kevin Holden. Kevin had lived with his wife in Beckenham, in the southeast of London, and was employed by High Tech Washroom Solutions Limited. He was a dad of three and had several grandkids, being described by them as the best granddad in the world. That fateful morning, Kevin received a call that one of the telescopic urinals just outside the Palace Theatre was jammed, something that he was called to fix quite frequently. If you're not familiar with telescopic urinals, they're essentially something that the UK's had for 20 years, I'm not sure if they're overseas, but they're essentially a urinal for men that's concealed within the ground during the day. However, when night falls, it will rise out of the ground, creating an effective makeshift public toilet. As I said previously, this kind of job was something that Kevin would be called to fix often, so that day he thought nothing of it and got in his work van to make his way to the urinal, arriving at approximately 10.30am. Kevin made good progress, attacking it with all the tools in his arsenal. At 1pm, the work was almost done when suddenly the urinal became unjammed, dropping back into its closed position. With Kevin on his hands and knees, halfway inside, the urinal came crashing down on his waist, pinning his upper torso underneath. Now these urinals are not light. They're made out of metal and are actually controlled by powerful hydraulics below. The weight of the urinal, paired with the immense power of the hydraulics, a routine job turned into a true nightmare. Paramedics were called at 1pm, detailing that a man was severely injured in the urinal. Firefighters and paramedics arrived at the scene and they'd never seen anything quite like it. Kevin, who was only able to be identified by his oyster card, was jammed with the upper half of his torso trapped within the urinal underground with the bottom half of his body sticking above. They tried desperately to get the urinal back into its open position, but of course, it was now jammed in the closed position. Ambulance crews and at least 25 firefighters battled to get him out, as crowds of people enjoying a day out in the West End pubs observed. They tried using crowbars and complete brute force, but it wasn't even budging, it was completely jammed. This is when they called for a special vehicle to lift the urinal, but this is when they found out it wouldn't be there until at least quarter past three. More than two hours after the urinal had dropped, firefighters finally managed to lift the entire urinal out the ground with the help of an industrial crane. I can only imagine the amount of pressure that was being applied to Kevin if it took a crane to get him out. When they did, it was clear that Kevin was in a terrible state. An air ambulance was called and arrived on scene and escorted him to the nearest hospital. But sadly, he succumbed to his injuries on the way there. A post-mortem concluded that his official cause of death was compression asphyxia. This incident forced the government to review the safety procedures of these telescopic urinals, eventually closing other ones around the area as a precautionary measure. This horrifying story takes us back to 1998 in the Harvestein Bakery in a town called Walsall. Working at the bakery in 1998 was a 47-year-old man named David Mayers. He was the general maintenance man of the bakery and he would be on call to sort various jobs around the factory. Now, Harvestein Bakery opened in Leicester in 1800 and in 1998 employed over 400 people producing bread for major supermarkets. In May of 1998, as the dough trays entered the ovens en masse, there was a sudden critical problem with one of the vast 75 foot long bread ovens. Somewhere deep inside, a grid had fallen off and the company were really worried that it would get caught up in the machinery and completely ruin the insides. So they had to get it fixed. Now at first, they did consider getting a specialist to dismantle the oven, but in the end, they decided that they would repair it in-house. They asked if David could accompany the engineer through, something that he had never been asked to do before. He didn't really want to do it at first, but the company offered a tantalizing bonus for doing it. 
so he eventually agreed. That fateful morning, at approximately 9am, David arrived at work and met with two engineers. One senior engineer overseeing everything and one engineer that would be entering with him. When the trio arrived that morning, it had been baking bread all night. So the first thing they did was switch it off and wait for it to cool down. The management had been told by the ovens manufacturers that this operation should take four men at least 12 hours. However, the company would lose £1,000 for every hour the oven wasn't baking. Of course, they didn't want to lose 13 grand, so they came up with a better idea. Instead of letting the oven cool properly, industrial fans were set up around to blast cold air through. To be even more stingy, the managers decided that they could go through the entrance hatch to avoid the cost of removing the side panels, something that they would later regret massively. Just two hours after turning the oven off, at 11 a.m., Ian and David donned a thin heat protective suit, hat and gloves with protected knee and elbow padding. Armed with their walkie-talkies, they carefully crawled onto the still moving conveyor belt and let it take them inside. Just five minutes after entering, frantic screams began coming from the radio, saying that the oven was far too warm. The last thing that was heard was, get us out. In a complete panic, the engineer standing by tried to reverse the conveyor belt, but to his absolute horror, he realized it was a one-way system. There was absolutely nothing he could do. The two men had no option but to ride it out all the way to the other side. An agonizing 17 minutes later, the oven was finally broken open with the help of a crowbar and the technician was dragged out. Sadly, he was burnt to a crisp from head to toe. He collapsed and died right there on the factory floor. David, however, was nowhere to be seen. He remained trapped inside the machinery and had to be freed by the fire service that evening. An autopsy revealed that the pair had broken most of their bones and sustained terrible burns to 80% of their body. Investigators soon discovered that the oven should have been left to cool for at least 10 to 12 hours before anyone should have entered. To make it even worse, if any of them had glanced over to the temperature gauges before going in, they would have seen they read in excess of 100 degrees Celsius, enough to boil water. The two men went through hell on earth. The attention then turned to who was responsible. David's parents took the company to court, determined to get justice for their son. It's something that should never have been allowed to happen. If, the, if their men had have accepted their responsibility who was in charge, they could have seen how dangerous it was. In court, it was ruled that the tragedy occurred because the company put productivity above safety. The company and three of its directors admitted to their part in the tragedy, each pleading guilty to two charges of failing to provide a safe system of work. Harvestein Limited and its parent company were fined £600,000 or US dollars The managing director on shift was also fined £20,000. While Harvestein Bakery tried its best to improve its safety measures, profits sank to an all-time low and in 2005 they closed their doors for good, taking 400 employees with it. But that is the end of the video. Do let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you prefer the five list or do you want me to go back to the less involved 10? I'm interested to see your thoughts below. I'm not gonna lie, the men that perished in the oven truly gave me nightmares. It makes my skin crawl just thinking about what they went through. And Stephen being crushed by his mother-in-law's grave and buried just a few feet away from where he died, it's tragically bizarre. But as always, I will see you guys in the next one. Bye bye.